Tatiana, it's nice to see you tonight. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Good. Did you just watch the uh, Deep Web all over again? Yeah, that was actually the third time that I saw the movie. Okay. I didn't. It's my first time, and I didn't quite finish it just because of the technical problems at the beginning, so I didn't quite get to the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but I saw, you know, the, the bulk of it, and it actually is an extraordinary film. I'm so grateful for it because, I mean, you know, this stuff is not well known. I mean, I I feel like this was a really great gift, like a creative gift to this experience because it's such a compelling story, and it's really been portrayed only one way in the media. And to have this exploration of what happened and also a highlighting of the ethos of that community, I think that that's just something that I wouldn't expect to see in a movie that's being distributed through major channels. How major is the distribution at this point? Um, I, think, I, I think I saw there was a screening in, in Atlanta, so it seems to be getting some attention. Well, they've been on tour with it for quite a while now. When did I... When did they do the, the original one? Maybe in May. It was right after they, um, I don't remember. Anyway, they, they started probably around May. And they've been going around and doing all these different uh, filming, um, you know, film festivals or whatever. Yeah. But on September 1st, they started distributing it through iTunes and that kind of thing. I see. Okay. Yeah. I actually looked at iTunes today, and I was really happy to see there were a lot of positive reviews. Because you got to wonder okay, we all understand why this is a great movie, why this is a great thing, but to see what regular people are mm -hmm. feeling after watching such a powerful movie. I mean, the first time I saw it, it was devastating. It was so awful. Um, I don't know if, if, the, if it affected you. I mean, it's hard. Well, I just to. I followed the case so closely. Um, I, I'm not even sure. There, was a few, there were a few new things in it for me, but I had just been following the case so, so closely. I mean, you know, even from... From 2010, actually. Wow. Um, that there was that LinkedIn uh, message that they they quoted from Ross. You know, uh, well, he sent me a copy of that by email, actually, at the time. I don't know if I know what you're talking about. Well, this is when he, uh, you know, right before the Silk Road existed, and he they said that he had gotten interested in libertarian theory and he said he wanted to. Uh, participate in the creation of a simulation uh, where people were truly free to, to buy and sell what they wanted. And that there's, it was posted on his LinkedIn profile. He said that he was getting interested in this. Well, that exact text was, uh, or somewhat more or less, was something he had sent me, I don't know, if before or after. I think it was before he posted on LinkedIn. He sent, he sent, that, uh, he sent that to me. So I'm sorry, maybe you didn't know that. No, I think I, I, I had vaguely known it, but um, but I'm glad that you clarified it for me, and maybe some other people weren't aware of that either. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, what do we say about it all? I mean, I'm glad that people are hearing about it. It seems like a lot of different people have rallied behind it. I think that there's a really big emotional connection. And I think that people really like his... Um, his sort of leadership quality, I think, you know, he's he has a reason why he did what he did, and I think that that really resonates with a lot of people. Well, he was a, he was an idealist, and you know, it, it kind of is interesting to go through this history because it it, it recaptured for me personally at times that I really did, uh, you know, I was I was there, I lived through it, and this is this sort of dawning of the coming together of of. Tor and Bitcoin and and deep web sort of cypherpunk uh, theory, and there was a real sort of uh, heightened optimism at at the time, and we're talking about 2010, that um, that things really were going to change, and that well, and in fact they have changed, right? But but that the history was being remade, and I was chronicling this this whole thing pretty pretty closely. I was still a Bitcoin skeptic at the time, but. But in general, I think I, I, I was very much an enthusiast for the, the theory behind what Ross was doing. And it's very interesting, you know, to read his thoughts and his comments because they are just, you know, pretty much identical to my own thinking at the time, you know. Um, so, and I think, I think maybe, I was, you know, thinking back on it, there was a, a bit of naivety, you know, that, that um, 
if people hadn't entirely uh, understood uh, the severity of the state uh, response, you know, to that, you know. But, um, and there were also flaws in the Silk Road, right? I mean, it was a centralized server. It, was, it, was a, it still had a central point of failure, whereas now, nowadays things are much more sophisticated. Um, but of course, you know, it's impossible also to watch this film with a detachment from the person and personality and humanity of Ross himself, and um, we can't help but be, you know, constantly struck, as I'm sure you are, by, you know, where he is today and, and the suffering he's gone through and just the injustice and the shocking uh, treatment that he received uh, uh, for, for doing what was essentially a humanitarian service. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wish that I had, no, well, I mean, I don't really think I ever would have ordered drugs on the internet or anything, but I, I do wish that I had been aware of that community that had been building there. I didn't really realize that because by the time I got into Bitcoin, it was actually, I think the weekend, I was thinking about that earlier today, the weekend of the cryptocurrency convention that you had in Atlanta, that was the weekend that Ross got put in jail. Or it had been very closely after that, so everybody was talking about it. Well, but I didn't even know that they had that whole liberty angle or anything. I was just, I had no idea what was really happening with that. Well, it was an interesting situation because um, uh, uh, Silk Road had been taken down. I guess I hope that I have, I, I, I had actually, that, that convention that, I, that, I, that, that we did was, um, I think, the first conference on Bitcoin in the United States that it was not hosted by the Bitcoin Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think technically it was maybe the third that it ever happened. So that was very early on. I'm trying to think how early on that was. This was not that long ago, right? I mean, this... 2013, years. August. Oh, I'm sorry, October. Yeah, so, so really just two years ago. It's amazing to think how, how much has happened. Um, and I had become a convert to the viability of Bitcoin, I guess, you know, six, eight months earlier, and you know, threw together this conference very, very quickly. But mainly because I was, I was, I was very well. I had seen just how much neglect there had been in the theoretical space of what Bitcoin is and what it could be, and I found it just shocking, you know, that there's so many smart economists in the world specializing in money. Um, and yet, none of them had foreseen the creation of Bitcoin, and really none had really been theorizing or examining the implications of what Bitcoin could mean for the future, uh, you know, at all. And so I, th I threw the, together this conference just solely to make up for the absence of, of serious intellectual discussion of, of, of what Bitcoin implies, you know, and and that was an enormously sex successful conference, as you remember. But I think it was. Maybe it was two or three days before that conference took place that Silk Road was was, was taken down, and um, up until that time, everybody had assumed that the value of Bitcoin was entire. And I think Bitcoin at the time was, you know, maybe it was fifty or sixty dollars. I'm not I'm not sure exactly how much it was at the time uh, with the exchange rate. But people had assumed that the whole value of Bitcoin was its use in drug markets. And after the Silk Road was taken down, the value of Bitcoin uh, actually went up. <laughs> so it was, you know, for me it was, you know, an astonishing sort of proof of concept that Bitcoin had had come into its own. That it wasn't just, you know, value valued as a uh, on the Silk Road. So that was you know, really exciting. It's a bad thing that I mean, it's it's weird how the Silk Road has such a bad rap because it really was such an essential part of the maturation of the currency and of the technology. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating to see certain people kind of forgetting that and mm -hmm. shying so much away from it. Um, in general, I think in the community I see that happening sometimes. Now. Right, and we should be clear too, well that's, that's an interesting point, right? I mean people always forget the origins of everything. I mean people forget the origins of, of online video. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, everything begins and, and uh, by by edgier people. You know, the revolutionaries always are always, and the entrepreneurs are really pretty much the same people. The people who defy the the trends. And you know, we should be clear. And it's it's. I'm not sure if it's. Well, I guess it does come through in the movie, but you know, people think of the takedown of Silk Road um, as being 
you know, the end of an era, but actually, in the same way the takedown of Napster was the, was the beginning of sort of ubiquitous file sharing, it's the same way now. I mean, you know, the the online marketplaces are more sophisticated and larger than ever. I I saw the data the other day, and I don't remember what it is. Maybe maybe you remember it, but um, that the current uh, marketplaces on the deep web are doing you know a hundred times the business that Silk Road ever did at its height. Wow, it's almost like it was an advertisement for the idea. I don't know. There were so many, I think, I wonder what consequences were intended and what consequences were unintended. Um, I mean, I wonder if they saw Lynn Ulbricht coming or if they thought that they were dealing with a formidable opponent when, when dealing with Ross. I mean, he's a very likable person. I guess the movie touches on that, how they had to sort of vilify him and make him seem, you know, like a murderer just to kind of take him down a few pegs or something. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. I mean, you know, who who watching that doesn't think of himself or herself in the same sort of situation? I mean, you know, here's a guy who founded, you know, his, his actions that he did before he's founded Silk Road. He, he was uh, uh, running a, a, a book selling business that was designed to give money to charity. I mean, you know, this is, you know, this is an awesome guy. And, you know, Eagle Scout, I'm not even sure I knew that. I mean, this is just an all-around amazing person. Um, but yeah, when they when they grab you and they capture you and they control the messaging, they can turn you into into anything, you know. And 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 the the press just dutifully reports whatever the the, the government says says about you. So if they can get a good tagline on you, like online uh, drug lord, you know, then that's what sticks. Well, it's a very salacious story. I thought that the the trial itself was. Like the trial of the century, I felt like I was watching history unfold, and it was so dramatic. And I think that we all started out with a lot of hope, and then with you know things just started going downhill. I mean, it was to me the death of justice, or or my illusion of justice. It was completely shattered when that happened. What they were saying is is that they could have shown compassion and actually preserved their own power. But they didn't even bother. They were just saying, this is the boot of the state. We'll crush you underneath our feet. Don't even try and think of it. We don't care about upholding law. They didn't. And they, they made that very clear, I think. I think it was, a, it was a very aggressive act. Well, you're speaking to something that's a little bit devastating. And it's hard for us to, to deal with, I think, intellectually, um, which is the sort of the final realization that the system itself is fundamentally wicked and thoroughly uh, corrupt. And when they want their man, um, you know, uh, nothing else matters. Yeah, of all people, I think, especially libertarians, and this is kind of amusing or ironic to think about, libertarians tend to be naive about government power and, and about uh, law. Uh, like, libertarians are sort of filled with hope uh, for reforming the system, actually, that's one of the reasons uh, people are sort of activists. You know, they think that um, that maybe in the end the courts are fair. You know, that uh, a trial by the peers will um, ferret out you know the truth, and uh, somehow there can be a victory. We have to think that we're human beings, so we always have hope. And so to confront a situation that's just like fundamentally and egregiously cruel, arbitrary outrageous, uh, disregarding of all standards of justice and humanity, fairness and truth, is, is it's almost um, psychologically, I think, difficult for us to, to even process. Uh, and to suddenly realize, even if, even if we're libertarians, even if we have great skepticism of the state, that the system is actually far more rotten than we ever imagined. And that's sort of what the Ross trial um, did I think for many people, and it, and I think it's, there's an element of it that's a little bit demoralizing to come to realize that. I, I absolutely think so. I think it's super depressing. I mean, it's almost like when I know that you weren't under this illusion, but I reference this, you know, when I figured out that Ron Paul was never going to win, the the whole thing was rigged. It was just, I mean, complete theater nonsense, and that's why I don't really participate in the political process anymore. Um, and, you know, yesterday I had dinner with my family and they were talking about the political candidates. And yeah. one, of the, one of the people at dinner 
said that I don't think that women should be presidents because they have PMS, which is just like a side note. And I couldn't even believe this was a statement being made. Um, but then they were also saying, you know, how important it was to vote, and then they started shaming me that I was never going to vote again. And maybe I'll vote, whatever. But the point was is that I was saying to them, this is a complete illusion. You guys can't be honestly thinking that this is a real process. And seeing how deeply ingrained people are and how attached they are emotionally and just on a lot of different levels to that, if you vote, we can get a new world. And even the people who are saying you can make an impact on local level, which I think to a certain extent that you can, but it's more like, let's just vote harder. Um, maybe in 30 years we'll be this much more free. <laughs> and it's just, it's crazy to me. And what happened with this case shattered another illusion, is is that the courts are there to protect us. And, and that had been slowly being chipped away over the past couple of years, but this really just drove it home how vicious and bad it is. Well, when you when you when you know the players who are involved in a in a particular case and in an entanglement with the courts and, and justice, especially at the federal level, you know, much less if it's you yourself, you know, it it it, it brings home um, the truth of, of the matter that you previously sort of been in denial about, really. I mean, look, this happens to me. You know, I, I think maybe you know this that I was, you know, a, a, a I rested a couple of weeks ago. For, yeah, no, I know. I saw and, the video. And, and, yeah, and, and uh, you know, d just to encounter the system again, even at this dopey level, this is a dopey little, you know, town in Georgia, you know, uh, with a little cell and, you know, whatever. But just to even encounter it at that level, it's, it's astonishing just how, you know, completely disregarding of, you know, all standards of fairness and decency and justice and humanity the system tr truly is, and you know, and, and like and, you know, that the, you know, my experience was is dopey and cartoon-like compared to uh, what Ross has been through. But I mean, think about how many people this is affecting. It's not just Ross. It's not just you. There's a myriad of other people, and it's really super racist. It's really classist. I mean, it's targeting the poor. It's ruining, destroying families. When these guys get out of jail, they can't get a job. Uh, while they're in jail, their family can't come and see them. Think about how messed up all of those kids are going to be growing up because their mother or father is in jail. And think about how screwed up their kids are going to be after that. And think about how bad it is for their friends because maybe they get a bad influence. Or God knows, I mean, it's it really has ripples throughout society the way that the drug war has been handled, um, aside from the much larger issue of just the state being awful and, and you know, basically thieves. And we're just now beginning to have a, that's a, you know, the ideas you're talking about just now are, are, are just just beginning to be discussed about, uh, discussed publicly in politics. I mean, just beginning. Um, the Republicans aren't talking about it at all, of course, uh, except for Rand Paul the other night at the debate, and I, I'm sure you didn't watch it, but Rand actually brought up, you know, on his own accord, a discussion of the racial uh, uh, impact of, of the drug war. And he talked about, about, about prison reform. He didn't have a chance to elaborate on it, but he's the one person among all the Republicans that actually brought up this, this subject, which is very interesting. And, yeah. um, you know, um, I also find it interesting that you know, in these the, the latter days of of of, of Emperor Obama, um, that even he is starting to actually raise the topic and and talk. Do about you think it. that's sincere? Do you think that's a PR move? I don't. I don't. I don't believe it's sincere. Who knows anymore with, with with these guys? But but whether it's sincere or not, whether it's PR move, I still I still welcome it. I, I think it's I think it's a you know at least a step in the right direction to to have some discussion of the topic. I mean, this is. This is an egregious situation, you know, that feeds to the, speaks to the fundamental injustice and inhumanity of, of the worst aspect of the state. Uh, by the way, you know, Tatiana, you know, I've sort of been in libertarianism for, for some years, uh, and this subject of the criminal justice system and how egregious it is, 
you know, has not always been part of uh, liber libertarian thinking. There's, you know, so a few thinkers that have speculated abstractly about, about, you know, markets for law and courts and stuff like that, but it's never been at the forefront of anybody's agenda within, within uh, the liberty world until really very, very recently. And that's kind of a, kind of a tragedy because in some way uh, it is the worst and most egregious part of the state. It's also, if you're just going to think abstractly about political philosophy, um, the worst thing, the, the, most, the most dangerous th power the state could ever have is a monopoly on law and justice and, and the courts and uh, the um, criminal justice system and jails. You know, that, if, if the state has that, it pretty much has all power over everything else. And the libertarians have only recently begun to seriously discuss the subject. I think that it's extremely important to me, you know, it, it, I don't think that the phrase is actually used in this instance, but it reminds me of we as a society are judged by the way that we treat our prisoners. If we administer justice in this grotesque way that is immoral, then what is that saying about our society as a whole? I'm not saying that all prisoners should get cupcakes and foot massages, but I think that we lose our humanity by allowing them to be treated worse than animals. I I just can't, it, I can't get behind that. I feel a lot of compassion for those people because even when you see people who, who've done something really bad, you know, a murderer, and I don't think that people who are murderers should get away with it or anything, but you have to wonder, why did they get that way? What made them do that? And I don't think it's always just their evil, throw them in the trash and incinerate them. I think that there are different um, illnesses in our society that are producing these people. And maybe some of them are just genetically or chemically messed up, but there are a myriad of different reasons why people end up sinning or committing a crime. And I think that we enrich ourselves as human beings by trying to understand that versus just closing the door completely and forgetting that whole entire segment of society. Yeah, and you said an interesting phrase there. You said, I don't think a murderer should get away with it. But you know, what's, what's interesting about that phrase is that the murderer does get away with it. I mean, the deed is done. You know, a murderer has killed somebody and there's nothing in this world that is going to bring that dead person back to life. So, so, so once you recognize that, you realize that there's absolutely no chance for justice in that case. There's no way to resurrect a life, to compensate um, the victim. There's the person is dead. So then the next question is, what do we do about it in a way that's um, not harmful to society, uh, that that's somehow addresses the reality of the situation while not having the illusion that somehow you're going to bring uh, justice about? And you know, I'm of the opinion that uh, that if we if we got the state out of the question, out of out of out of the um, uh, you know, out of the picture here, that a society could come up with better solutions than we currently have, which haven't changed at all in you know thousands of years. It's always the same damn thing. It's it's grab the guy, uh, put him on trial, throw him in in. Uh, behind bars and, and for the rest of for the rest of his life. And I, I just don't, I don't. Or kill him. There's always that. Yeah, that was the, the, the traditional one. Um, so yeah, it would just be wonderful if we could get a little more creative, you know, in criminal justice, but that's never gonna happen as long as the states have got a monopoly. Um, listen, I, um, I just remember something that really stood out to me in the Deep Web film that I had never thought of before. I thought it was extremely interesting. Uh, there's this period where Ross leaves uh, graduate school, moves back to Austin, starts this, this, this business that, that didn't work. And he writes his friend that he wishes now in retrospect he had joined a fraternity uh, because at least then he would have some kind of network to draw on uh, to see you know, what he would like to do next with his life. So I thought that was extremely interesting because you now here he is, um, what, 26, something like that. And really just kind of a, doesn't know what to do. 
you know, doesn't doesn't know where to go, who to call, how to contact, what are you going to do? Send in resumes. Everybody knows that's just useless. So there was a sense of of, of feeling feeling lost and and not knowing where to go, or who to talk to, who to turn to for for advice. Uh, well, uh, uh, the absence of a real social network that he could uh, draw on. And I've written about this in the past, but this is a universal problem among sort of twenty somethings. This, this sense of, you know, they went through 12 years of school, then they went through another four years of school, and maybe they went through another two years of school, and they just keep going to school, 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 listening to professors graduating, and then being set out into the world of society says, okay, now you've got the, now you've got the stuff to be a successful person. But they, at no point in their life have they really been able to build up anything like a permanent, robust, reliable, uh, system for for networking, uh, finding you know people in various industries and and uh, uh, people that care about you and you care about them and and you can work together with them. And it was pretty clear that that Ross just just didn't have that. And Ross is hardly alone in this. But I hadn't actually considered until I watched this film tonight, uh, you know, the extent to which this this feature um, was you know had, had played such an important role in his own decision making. Well, I mean, he created that environment around himself. He created his own social network of like-minded people. It's kind of like Liberty.me, but you guys know the drugs. Yeah. Uh, by the way, did you ever, um, I knew people who had outstanding orders at um, the Silk Road at the time the thing went down. Not for drugs, but for fake IDs. Uh, which, you know, we have, this country has the highest drinking age, you know, in the world outside, you know, just a handful of Islamic states. Um, and everybody between the ages of, you know, 16 or 17 and, and 21, you know, faces this, you know, extreme problem. I mean, these, these laws on drinking age are just, just totally out of control. I, I, I mean, once you start considering the social consequences of this stuff, you can see there's a very strong relationship between the campus rape crisis and the, the drinking age laws that don't allow women to you know just be out in public and have normal uh, uh, public lives um uh, you know that it's created this kind of uh, uh speakeasy culture on campus um, but it's also just led to just you know mass law breaking on a vast scale and anybody who who wants to drink in those age in that age group tries to figure out how to get a, a fake id so this was another major thing that Silk Road do, did. They allowed experts in creating these fake IDs to be able to get to get them to people, so that the person who's twenty could, you know, buy a beer at the convenience store. So you know, we're not exactly talking. Um, you know, this is not criminality traditionally understood. <laughs> you know, this is just trying to trying to get around egregiously stupid laws, and that was just one of the services that, that Silk Road, you know, offered. I wish that they had that when I was 14. We had to go to 42nd Street or send somebody to 42nd Street and we'd get these really lousy college IDs. I mean, this has been going on forever. So is it good to have more fake IDs out there? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, well, we need to do something about the laws. I mean, you know, and so long as these laws exist, there's a vast market for them. You know, and, and they exist in, in every single city and town in this country, a vast marketplace for fake IDs and, you know, talk to a typical bouncer at, at a bar in any, in any any city in this country and he'll tell you stories of, of um, confiscating fake IDs, you know, night after night after night after night. And the reason they confiscate them is that they look too fake. I mean, mostly they want to believe that the, that the IDs are real because these places want to do business. I mean, so it's turned every every bar and convenience store in America into a, into a kind of an arm of, of the government to enf enforce these you know, ridiculously unenforceable laws. It leads to a mass disrespect on the part of young people towards you know, the social order and the legal system that, um, that under which they live and habituates the uh, young people into a, a culture of hiding and secrecy, uh, binge drinking, and um, you know the the, con the social and cultural consequences of this of this of these laws are just outrageous. So I mean, to me, the fact that Silk Road, you know, actually, and they had the best fake fake ideas of anybody on on on, on the planet, really, and everybody knew that at the time that that was the go to place to get a, 
a decent fake ID, so you could have, so you could exercise your human rights. I mean, that's all this is really about in the end, you know. So that was an that was an amazing service. That was that was extraordinary. And, and I don't know, I I'm not a, a a dark web person really, but I'm sure there's you know hundreds, if not thousands, of um, places you can get them now still. But I know the Silk Road provided a really reliable way. Yeah, I think that the whole relationship in this country with um, alcohol and sex and drugs is really, really out of whack. It's like if you look on TV, the type of behavior that they really encourage, it's just, you know, drinking and doing drugs and being slutty and getting down and party, party, party. But then the laws say the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. and And I think it makes people associate a rebellious nature with that bad behavior, which I think propagates that very behavior. If you, I noticed, I started watching, you know, just regular TV or whatever, and people are always drinking in every single scene. And it's weird. It's like, how do these people stay alive if they're drinking that often? Um, I, I think that it's almost like the only way to have fun if you look at TV and and uh, and media and different kinds of things like that, that seems to be the only way to do it. Which I enjoy, um, you know, drinking from time to time, whatever, just like anybody else. But it's kind of over over the top, in my opinion. I don't know. It just seems strange and out of whack. It, it, this country is insane. I mean, never forget Tatiana when you think about this country's culture and its legal system and its government. And for that matter, it's people and its values that this is the country that attempted to abolish for all time and eternity the production and distribution of alcohol. Yeah, they did a really great job. <laughs> that really happened not that long ago. So, <laughs> you know. I wonder why they were able to, to wipe out. Um, marijuana or drive it down uh, over so many years versus alcohol. I think people like alcohol better. I think it's worse. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, there's other well, I mean, stuff which have like varying levels, but. The whole marijuana thing is going away too. Although, you know, I, you know, I don't think we should, we should be, we should be naive about this either. I mean, I don't know if you read my story about, about the, the jail situation, but you know, this is a country where, I mean, I don't understand the whole um, marijuana thing too well, but I do understand that that it's 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 uh, it's absolutely ubiquitous, right? I mean, like I, I can't even believe uh, how ubiquitous pot is. Uh, it shocks me because when I was a kid, it, um, things were a little bit different. Lots of people smoke pot. Parents smoke pot. Everybody smokes pot. I mean, and, 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 and as far as I can tell, I mean, it's like I like everybody but me. I'm like the one American left, you know, who doesn't smoke pot. You don't need to smoke pot to be cool. You can just have a martini. It's acceptable. I, I I don't smoke pot, and you know, I because I I don't like it, and you know, just like it's just well, um, so it's not my thing. But you know, I, and and I'm not saying that like pridefully either you know i mean it's just it's 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 just like a preference thing right but like it doesn't matter to me either way <coughs> but <coughs> but so you've got pot like everywhere you know you can't go to an after party of any event i've ever been to that is not just like after party means we're gonna smoke pot i mean that's just <laughs> I figured this out i'm so stupid you know i, I never go to after parties and one time i went and every, you know walked in and just, you know it's like you know, enveloped with this pot everywhere I'm like what the what the hell oh this is the purpose of the after party you know and uh anyway it's, it's a whole weird culture of smoking pot but but now it's more and more legal in all places and people you know walk outside and they're like you do, do you want to go outside for a cigarette and what they mean is pot you know and they're outside smoking pot in the open and i forget now where it was recently it was, maybe it's pittsburgh or something I don't know. it seems to be legal in weird places and weird times and now you know colorado is just, you know massive industry and everything else anyway um, so when I was arrested this a um, uh, couple weeks ago, and they threw me this, this cell, you know, I'm standing there, you know, like an idiot, you know, behind these bars, you know. And did you have your? Um, were you wearing your traditional bow tie? Yeah, it was funny. Right? No. No, no, I was, I was extremely dressed up when they, when they. Oh my were. gosh. And you know when they. <laughs> when nothing they, better to do than harass you. You know, you know um, whatever. I mean, 
white privilege, you know, helped me that day. I can tell you, but um, um, but you know, when they when they put your hands behind your back and you know, they, you know, they said, well, look, your, your license is suspended. I said, no, it's not. I showed them the paper, and you know, there's an argument between the cops because the municipal court disagreed with the DMV and so on. Anyway, so the guy said, well, I got, you know, look, I got to arrest you. So he, he arrests me and throws me in the cop car, and I'm like, you know, okay, I don't have my cell phone. I don't have you know anything, you know, whatever. Whatever, you, whatever you're carrying at the time you step out of the car, that's what you're going to take to jail with you. And, you know, you don't have any choice about it, you know, so you should think about what you're carrying on your person because any of us could be arrested at any time. But anyway, so no, I mean, when they took me in, it was pretty funny because, you know, I had to take off my clothes and I did a thorough search and I began to take off my, my tie and then, you know, my collar and the, you know, the thing on the back that holds it on and, you know, the... the yeah, the the, uh, the guards. What were, must they have thought of you? They, I mean, yeah, they were nice. Um, they were nice to me. I mean, given that they were capturing me, you know, they were pretty nice. And and you know, I was I was being a bit of an, uh, an ass. But, um, the uh, there were funny things that happened. Like I said, well, again, I gotta I gotta use the phone, you know. And they're like, okay, so, so I'm sitting I'm sitting down using the phone on the swivelly chair thing. And the guards were kind of talking about the game or something that night. So I saw all my stuff in a, in a package there. So I reached in and grabbed my cell phone and started taking selfies. And I was trying to take like pictures yeah. of the phone on the wall. And I started kind of going, yeah. And, and the guard comes and says, what are you doing? You can't use your cell phone. What are you, you know, get back in that cell, you know. So they're kind of, you know, uh, so that, you know, but I mean, generally they were, you know, given that they arrested me pretty nice. Anyway, my, my story is that the, so like right after me, who comes in, but a but a Hispanic man. They gave him a much much rougher uh, kind of treatment. I mean, he was up against the wall doing a, you know a really egregious search of him. But they reached into his pocket and found it was about like like my little finger um, amount of pot, like really just a, a flakes. Like when they held it up in a bag, it 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 went to the corner and, and constituted like that much. And um, what's this, buddy? <laughs> This little piece. I mean, what are you serious? Yeah, this really happened. So the, he holds it up and he goes, and they threw the guy in. So they tested it and they said, Are they mad? Well, no, they're thrilled. Um, cause, cause, uh, the cop who arrested him, you know, yelled out throughout the whole jail. He said, We got ourselves a felon, you know, and everybody a started, felon? yeah, high fiving each other. Yeah. But for what? Having a, having a tiny little bud of wheat? Yeah. So the, it's a felony charge of, uh, trafficking narcotics in a correctional facility. Holy moly. That's really bad. Yeah, and this is a guy who was arrested for a failure to appear on a uh, uh, some sort of moving move violation, I presume it's like speeding or something like that. And he just didn't show up um, to the courthouse, uh, you know, on the right day or whatever it was. You can never need to put that on my Google calendar because I still have to do that. But so when they arrested him, you know, he happened to have a few pot flakes in his pocket. And because he walked into the jail with him, uh, he was, he was uh, you know, felony charge of, of, of trafficking narcotics in a correctional facility, which, you know, I haven't looked it up, but, you know, what's that, 10 years or something in jail? You know, I don't know what it is. But you know. I just find it appalling that this is how the system is being utilized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, really? That's pot. It's pot. just crazy to me. Pot. Yeah, that's happened right in front of my eyes, and and so you know, I tell you what, I wasn't feeling suicide myself that day, you know, because I mean, look, you know, yeah, they took my car, they humiliated me, took all my clothes, threw me behind bars, and and you know, charged me a gazillion dollars, and thank God I had my credit card with me, right? You know, so yeah, I, I got pillaged, and I you know, lost a day. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty damn scary actually. Be handcuffed if you have never been handcuffed and put in the back of a, a police car. It's uh, it's really uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, all that's really annoying and everything. But you know, this this poor Hispanic man, uh, my God, you know, I'm sure he's still entangled in the situation right now. Maybe he's out on bail. I don't know. But you know, there's still going to be a trial, and God knows what happens to him after this. You know, so I I just wasn't I wasn't feeling too sorry for myself at that point. And I did what I could to kind of bring comfort to him. But, you know, it's a little bit like what you said about Ross. It's like you feel a sense of powerlessness. It's like the system is so big and so egregious and so horrible. Um, 
you know, you just, and, 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 and it's hard to kind of like psychologically deal with the fact that there's nothing that we seem to be able to do about it. And the cuts against something in our natures, I think we believe and we go through all of life believing that ultimately um, there should be justice and things should be fair and that, that good things should triumph over evil. And if we take the right steps in life, um, that that fundamentally um, egregious evil dehumanizing institutions and behaviors will be selected out, you know, that, that we can stop this. Um, and it's very, very difficult, I think, for us to confront a situation where there's that nice, nice uh, Hispanic man in, in the cell with me or, or Ross, where you just see, you know, a, a terrible evil system um, crushing a, a perfectly wonderful, valuable, productive, beautiful human being. And um, it's hard to believe. And, and touching on the whole time I was in, I, I was in jail, I kept asking. I said, I said to the guard, I said, "You're you're going to charge this guy with a you're going to charge this guy with a felony because he had a few marijuana flakes in his pocket." I said to him, "I said, you know what? Your son smokes pot. In fact, you smoke pot." How? Did, what did you base that on? You just said it. I said it to him, yeah. I said, how can, I said, your son smokes pot. You smoke pot. Everybody here in this jail uh, uh, you know, smokes pot. You know this. How can you participate in the system? And what did he say? He said the same thing everybody said to me that day anytime I confronted him with a question like this, the same phrase. Just doing my job. Oh. That's what they always say. And that is what they're doing. That's they're what. Doing. Nazis were saying, I'm just doing my job. I mean, people think that's a really harsh contrast, but you know, that compliance, that going along with it and doing the dirty work of the state is is a really big problem. It, you and, know, I, I, I feel, yeah, I, I have odd mixed feelings about this really. I, like, I, I don't think anybody should work for these institutions obviously yeah. they're fundamentally unjust but 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 just because somebody doesn't work for them doesn't mean that nobody works for them so there'll always be somebody who needs a job needs that kind of economic security um and law enforcement in this country is not so disreputable that uh everybody working in the system is not immediately regarded as, as being horrible. In fact, they have quite a very high status, you know, uh, in our public, in our public culture. So uh, I don't know what to say about the people who say they're just doing their job because I think what must happen to many of them is that they go to work for the system thinking it's, 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 it's okay. They're going to do good. I mean, uh, probably a lot of people do go to work for them and there are some bad people in jail, you know, there are criminals and so on and they do catch them some bad guys sometimes and maybe from time to time they do feel like they're doing good but then the the more the evil they do overwhelms the good they do uh, the more they just get kind of demoralized but there's also a kind of a numbing of the conscience that begins to take place over time the more you're part of the system and the more your eyes are open to as thorough how thoroughly corrupt it is and your illusions begin to go away you you kind of develop a sense that well life's just shitty you know uh, everything's just shitty and uh, these people are terrible my, my co-workers are terrible the people around the system is terrible everything's corrupt there's no escape from corruption i might as well just i might as well just endure this and, and just kind of keep going on with my life and you know um get drunk in the evenings and watch the game on the weekends and uh, otherwise just you know wait wait for the clock to to finish ticking until i die i mean that's i think that that's more or less how these people think. I mean, they've, they've lost all sense of idealism and lost any sense that there can or should be any justice in the world. In fact, I, th I think it's very similar, Tatiana, to, to what happens to soldiers uh, when they're in war. Um, you know, they're sent off to foreign lands and, and uh, they discover very quickly, you know, the deep corruption of the system, the incompetence of the generals. Uh, the, just the immorality of what they're doing and and they just have to kind of deal with it and they go ahead and they pull the trigger and they drop the bombs and they they, they, uh, they uh, turn the controls on the drones and 
and um, uh, slaughter, slaughter the people, and they do it out of self-protection. And eventually, that is, they they lose their that that sort of core morality that that exists within our hearts and our souls. It, it just begins. It's like a blanket just covers it up, and 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 people become eventually just beasts and and monsters. Uh, uh, un unknowingly, or maybe they justify it to themselves, and they perpetuate the system. It's something like that, and I, th I think working for the criminal justice system in this country is very similar to that. So when you're when you're when you're participating uh, in a in a egregiously evil uh, system, and and you are with your own hands inflicting that evil on on other people something has to happen to you. I mean, in a weird way, what happens is that you be, you become yourself uh, um, identical to the criminals, the worst of the criminals that you're locking up. And the, the difference between you is uh, begins to sort of evaporate. You're all part of the same structure of evil. Gosh, that's depressing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but I think it's, I, I think that that's, that's very true. Um, and the other part of it, you know, before you had mentioned, you know, that they had probably been nicer to you because, you know, you're a white guy wearing a suit and a bow tie. You oh, don't sure. look like um, a person that lives in the ghetto. And um, I think that I don't really like to dwell too much on white privilege because I think then it goes too far and it's like, all right, I feel like we should all be focusing on our humanity and uh, and focusing on that aspect. But I think a lot of white people and people who don't need to deal with the police, they think that the police are good. They think that the people in jail are bad and they just go along with that. And until they're face to face with that, actually experiencing it, that's when their minds are blown. So... But I don't know how we could get more people that don't, you know, get beaten up by the police or, you know, fall victim to different aspects of our society to to sympathize with the others because they can just blanket them and say, oh, you know, those are those people and and keep that divide going. I, I mean, the, the bourgeoisie in this country are just woefully naive about about the true nature of the system. However, um, the consciousness of of the corruption, the abuse, and the evil of the system is higher now than it's ever been in my entire lifetime, thanks to social media, um, and 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 uh, thanks to the fact that the system is getting so bad and so out of control that more and more people know about it. But still, we're just we're just at the beginnings. Um, uh, by the way, um, Tatiana. There's a wonderful book um, um, on the subject. Um, oh God! No, I just don't. I just now I'm not going to remember it. I just have to look this up. Um, I'm, you, you can just go ahead and talk because I uh, because I don't I don't remember remember the name of the book. And I'll, I'll but what it. is the book about? I don't want to derail it and just go into another thing. I don't know what the book is about. Well, just give me one quick second. Okay, you got it. Um, Eager viewers are standing by. Yeah, <laughs> this is just, I think it's actually kind of, I, I just wasn't thinking about it and I suddenly began. Well, you know, I actually was thinking about the prison industrial complex the other day and uh, I had heard that, this is like a little bit off topic, but still on topic, that Whole Foods was paying um, prisoners 60 cents a day mm -hmm. to produce tilapia and or cheese that was selling for $13 a pound at Whole Foods. Sure. And with a company that, you know, the founder talks about conscious capitalism, he literally has a book about that. I was really confused about what I thought about that. I thought, sure. well, prison labor in general, I find revolting and I'm not a fan. Sure. But then I think that I started looking at it a little bit differently because now Whole Foods was doing it. And I was thinking, is it okay that Whole Foods is doing this? 
So Bob Murphy actually did some research and he's writing something for Fee next week. For Fee? Um, yeah, I was hoping that he'd have it out by today. Um, he sent it over to me earlier and well, we've been talking. Do you watch Orange is the New Black? I do. You see so yeah, I know the whole, the panties thing. I mean, I think that they try and almost make light of it. I mean, well, I don't I mean, think it's I, as serious I mean, as it could be. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, the, the third season really highlights something that's really interesting for 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 people who hate the system and and love free enterprise and you know hate the criminal justice system and everything else. But you know, the the system is privatized, right? In season three, you know, it went from being managed by the state and it's privatized. In many ways, it got better because uh, they got better beds. Uh, the food got worse, which was interesting and more, you know, just horrible but the you know the beds are better and generally the conditions and in, in the in the system improve but the corruption is probably worse than 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 ever um but you know the the in, in orange they portray it as the women having a little more uh economic opportunity than they had before so um and so I'm, I think that's like the, the I think that's the illusion that they're trying to keep holding up and I just think that if you're in jail and you have no choices I don't think that that's just your free will trying to be a go-getter and get the better job. I, it's just, I don't know. Well, the whole the thing end, is, I find it distasteful yeah. and I, wrong. Funny, I'm completely against, um, well, one of the biggest problems with uh, prison privatization is it gives private enterprise a strong incentive to uh, enhance the, uh, the prison population to, to grow it and gives the private enterprise a strong incentive to you know, participate in the system that in the end is not about creating justice, it's about creating criminals. I mean, that's what the system needs to, to survive. Okay, so the name of the book that I would just strongly recommend to you and to any viewers um, is the single most powerful and, and remarkable book on this topic. I can't say enough good about it. In fact, I think it's kind of like the first and last word on the topic it is by Clarence Darrow. It's called Resist Not Evil, and um, it's written in of all times in 1902. So, you know, and, and he points out just the true nature of the criminal, the state-based criminal justice system, that there's no justice associated with it. Its purpose is to manufacture criminals with uh, absurd laws uh, to ensnare people so that it can, you know, get get human fodder essentially, so it can continue to exist and perpetuate itself, over the purpose of entrenching the power elite. I mean, that's that's the thesis. And when I read it, I mean, my, it rocked my world so hard. I've never really recovered from it, and I reread it every year just to remind myself um, uh, about the true nature of the systems. Clarence Darrow, he's the one who prosecuted the monkey uh, monkey trials, scopes monkey trials. Um, in the 19, what, 20s. Um, but this book was written in 1902. It's a criminal defense attorney. Um, is this not evil? You can get it free online, Amazon. It's on Liberty Me, actually. Uh, the best edition's on Liberty Me because that has my introduction to it. But, um, but I just strongly recommend anybody read that because it, this is not really about corruption of the system. In the end, Tatiana, it's about the system itself. Yeah, that was um, something that you know, um, I was hoping to talk about like seeing it in, in real life, um, in Ross's case, I think was, had so many different implications, you know, it was what was happening that day in that moment, in that place, but the concept of putting people in jail and how do you deal with society and its sins, um, so to speak, it's really, really weird. It's really weird that you can put certain people in cages. How do you? How well do you know um, Ross? Do you want to talk in any detail about that? Um, well, you know, I I am really close with his mom and his sister, okay. um, and I've been corresponding with Ross now for a while. Um, I don't know. We've we've been writing, which is really nice, because he's really really nice writer and you get a very distinct sense of his personality and he's so sweet and thoughtful and it's actually a great pleasure for me because when you think about i mean that sounds bad but when you think about the way that people interact with one another and the walls that they put up with one another there's 
that's missing in this in this exchange and it's something special and it's something where you can be thoughtful when you write somebody and, and you can reflect and then have them do the same, which is lost in the immediacy of today's communication methods. Everybody's texting or calling, and those are great methods of communicating, but there's something really nice about the written word. And then uh, Lynn had to go to Porkfest uh, in June, and she had asked me if I would go and visit Ross. And, you know, to me, that's somebody that I really look up to. He's, you know, rebel revolutionary that's my kind of people and i was happy to go but i didn't really get a, a big primer on what that experience was going to be like so i went down um to the jail which is uh in in the southern part of new york city and before i continue just to be clear i was asked as a friend of the family as a friend of ross to go it wasn't as a journalist which is Part of the reason why I haven't really talked about it because it's more of a personal thing, but I thought it might be nice for people to to know what that experience was like for me because it was left such an impression on me. I felt changed as a human being afterward. Um, so I went to Southern New York City uh, down by the courthouses and stuff, and you you arrive there and there's something called the bus stop to nowhere, which is the nickname for this glass enclosure that looks kind of like a bus stop right in front of the prison except obviously nothing happens there and so i went in there i had read online all the different things that you had to wear there's all these regulations about your clothing and whatnot and so i showed up and i had it was easily 100 degrees outside i had really really long shorts to my knees and kind of like a baggy shirt uh like a blouse and I got there, there wasn't anybody to ask what the story was. There wasn't really a good sense of direction. There were a few small uh, Spanish families mainly. And finally the guard comes over and he was really, I mean, he set the tone for the entire experience. I think if I had dealt with somebody that was a little bit more human and compassionate and normal and not wildly aggressive, I would have had a slightly more acceptable time. but. He was so mean, he was saying, I can't wear shorts. And I said, look, you know, on your website, I checked several times. It says that you're allowed to wear shorts up to your knees, not even to mouth off, but so he understands that other people will come up with this conclusion as well. This is not a good policy. If you have a different dress code, you should have it available for people to understand it. So he starts yelling at me because he says, I can't have open toe shoes and I can't have shorts. and he wouldn't tell me what to do. So finally, some meek voiced woman says, there's a spot down the street at the Ch little in Chinatown. So I go down the street, I'm wandering around, I find some random Chinese store and the ladies are like, what can we help you with? And I said, oh, I need pants. They say, oh, prison pants. I'm like, yeah, prison pants. And so they, they have sh pants that they give to people because this happens a lot. And then they sold me some little, those little Chinese slippers and they were really kind. And it was something that was really appreciated because I was so shocked at the unreasonable aggression. It just seemed completely unnecessary. And so I went back to the hot little glass room with my new clothes and there was this really pretty Spanish girl in the corner. And that same guard, he starts jeering at her saying, huh, what are you gonna do? Wait for him for 20 years? What are you gonna do? <laughs> I mean. What kind of a cruel, vicious animal is kicking this girl while she's down? She's there to see her boyfriend and he's gonna threaten her with, I mean, how, how awful is that situation for her already? And I look at her and I'm, I try and make eye contact to say, is this like a real thing that I'm watching? And she wouldn't even really look at me and she kind of, you know, looked up and everybody in that room, all of a sudden I started noticing that people wouldn't look at each other it was like they had already been beaten down to submission where they weren't allowed to show their humanity and their compassion or their acknowledgement of the ludicrous nature of this entire situation. So that was really disturbing. And then we went inside and they rifled through my bag for 20 minutes. I mean, give me a break, guys. Uh, and then I stuff my stuff in the locker and can't get the things in the locker. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And so then they they put you through the um, metal detector. And I had an underwire bra. I mean, most bras are underwire. And they almost didn't let me in because I had a bra on. 
And that wasn't on the list either. And so finally the guy lets me go through the mean guy. And then I start walking past everybody and I didn't even roll my eyes. I might've rolled them the slightest bit, not even toward him. And he's like, don't roll your eyes at me or you'll never come in here when I'm on the thing. So then they line us up. I'm trying to keep my composure because this is really driving home. This is what jail is. It's not what you see on TV. It's not what you hear about in all these little stories. And you know, at the rallies and we say, oh, we'll get arrested for this. I mean, this is a real nasty, disgusting, horrible place where they lock people up forever and ever and they're never let out. So it was very upsetting. And I'm waiting there and they finally bring me upstairs. They bring us all together. The other guard was slightly more nice. They bring us into this big glass enclosure room. And I thought it was just a regular room. So I'm sitting there. The guard calls me out and he says, you know, I could see everything through your pants. So you shouldn't wear those pants. And I'm like, these are the prison pants. And then I go back in and then there's all children there with their parents or with their moms. And they're running out to the vending machine. I mean, you're not allowed to bring anything upstairs with you. And the lady comes out and she's like, don't let your kids come out here. They get one candy machine visit or they're out of here. And these are children visiting their parents in jail. Have a little bit of decency. And so I'm still sitting there and all of a sudden I'm looking at this guy across from me and he's got this yellow outfit on. And I'm like, oh, that's a weird look. I'm like, it's not so bad. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me that actually I'm surrounded by prisoners and their families are with them. But because they all had different colored suits, I didn't know that, that they were prisoners. And so I positioned myself so I could see Ross because there was two glass things. So there's a glass, our glass room, and then another glass room that also had people. And the prisoners, they come from over there and then they come through the room and then he comes toward me. So you know, he came up to me. It's a very weird situation. I don't know this guy. I mean, other than what I had read, but you know, I give him a big hug and then the reality of it was just unavoidable. I couldn't keep it together. So I'm sitting there crying and I'm so mad at myself because I just wanted to cheer him up and be happy or something. And, and instead here's this guy who's in, in jail for life, comforting me saying, it's okay, you know, it's okay to cry, it's okay to feel what you're feeling. And it was so shocking to me that he could, he could put aside his own suffering and show compassion for another human being and, and show that this was, this was a really human experience. And so, you know, I chilled out, he's like, it's okay, it's okay to cry. And then, you know, we started talking and I was there for about an hour and we didn't talk about the case. I mean, what is there to really talk about? Um, I came there more to talk to him about, you know, how he's doing and stuff. And, you know, I've heard Lynn and Callie and stuff talk about how he's optimistic and I had experienced it, but experiencing it in, in real life, it was so surprising. I felt like I really learned a lot about the capacity for humanity. Um, and and his ability to remain optimistic and to remain human and and emotionally engaged it was really really surprising at one point you know i said to him ross how do you keep it together in here and he said well this old timer he taught me this guy had been there for 12 years and he said listen you're going to lose it in here if you don't allow yourself to feel what you're feeling so what happens is in general all the guys like if they i guess ross is probably a little bit more in touch with his feelings realistically but you know, his approach and some other people is he just kind of goes, hangs out in his room for a couple of days, lets the emotion pass, lets the depression pass, but really actually feels it and then kind of goes on from there. And think about how many people are running away from their emotions on an every single day basis. People don't want to deal with anything. And here he's living almost a more exemplary life in some ways. And then I felt bad that I didn't have the candy machine money because I thought I could get him some snacks or something. I don't know what they're feeding him. And I said, oh, I could get you some Doritos, but I forgot the money. He says, oh, it's okay. I don't eat Doritos. And I said, what do you mean you don't eat Doritos? I eat Doritos all day. And so do most people, right? And he's like, well, you know, I see these guys, they come into jail and they're, you know, ripped and they're muscular. And then they start eating the cakes. And after a couple of months of eating the jail food, they turn to jelly. He's like, so I don't eat the cake. And you know, I peel the I peel the skin from the chicken. 
because I don't want to get, you know, unhealthy. And I'm sitting there. I'm, I can't even imagine. I, I can't, I mean, I, I think most people have some sort of self-sabotage. They do bad things that they do. And here's this person in literally the worst situation. And he's able to try and be healthful, try and be mindful, trying to grow as a human being. And, you know, I asked him more about, about, you know, if it was violent there because it, obviously you worry, you hear these stories about guys getting raped in jail every two minutes and stuff. And he said that the, the jailed people or prisoners are pretty okay with each other. Like they're definitely broken across racial lines because this weird thing where it ends up actually being better. So there ends up being less violent because people feel that they're in a tribe. So they're less likely to mess with a larger tribe. I don't know. Some strange well, thing. That's, you see that in orange. They discuss that, you know, they, they say it's not racist it's tribal. Yeah. I mean, he also said that if you're white, you don't have to be a neo-Nazi. There are neo-Nazis, but then there's independent whites. So they're white people that are just hanging out with other white people because they have to hang out with white people, but they're not Nazis or anything. Um, and he was telling me very strange formulation. I, 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 I never imagined that because you were white and in jail, that meant that you had to be a neo-Nazi. I mean, that's just, I thought that was the only group that you could join. I mean, what do I know? I, I saw American history X in a couple other movies. I don't know anything about jail. <sighs> so then he was telling me about how there were certain people in there and a little bit about what was getting people in jail and that seemed to be just drugs i mean there was this one guy he was not an american citizen he had never stepped foot in america and he was in i don't know hong kong or something and he had this uh, he was a guard you know like a bodyguard or whatever and one of his bosses was this underworld lord you know really really bad violent scary guy who killed his own best friend when he tried to leave the organization so the evil bad guy, the violent guy, was um, apprehended by the police and he started making deals with the police. So they ended up getting this other guy, non-American citizen, never stepped foot in the United States, to be the transporter of the, the drugs from, let's say, Hong Kong to Thailand. It was supposed to end up in New York. But they didn't um, actually have any drugs and it didn't even go through with it. And then they ended up snatching him up anyway. And now he's in a jail in New York and he's not even a U.S. citizen. And what about the guy that was killing people? I mean, it was completely bananas. And then there was another guy who had tried to rob a bank and was almost successful. But the reason why he did it was because he had a cocaine addiction and he didn't want his wife to know. And he was in a lot of debt. And if there wasn't that stigma in our society, then maybe he wouldn't have tried to rob a bank. I mean, obviously it's not good to try and rob a bank or do a bunch of drugs so you're out of control, but I mean, these were not cut and dry criminals that I was hearing about. So uh, that's been my whole experience with anybody who's in the, in the jail. I mean, the first time I went to jail, I, I met a bunch of people that were in for a failure to, 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 to pay child support. Which, you know, is a very strange thing that that would be considered a, a crime. I mean, you know, in, in real life, not paying your debts is, is a, 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 a tort. And and they can collect your property and stuff like that. They need to declare bankruptcy and things like that. But, but with child support, you know, if they to pay as a, a criminal act, so they throw them to jail. Like, that doesn't help anybody. I mean, you know, so I don't know. I mean, I, I asked that Hispanic man that was in that was in the jail with me the other day. I said, uh, um, you know, what's the difference between being outside and being inside in your view? He said, um, being outside means you're lucky and being inside means you're unlucky. That's it. That wow. That's a really, I think that's a really important statement. I don't know. I think that's something that people need to remember because I think it could really be so many different people that I know. And seeing Ross behind bars, I mean, I feel like we, we developed a really, really strong bond that day. Um, it was really, really, really nice. But I, I mean, he could be any of my friends. He could be so many different people. And especially the way that his his crime is, polit crime is politically motivated. I mean, think about how many people that we know that are doing stuff that's anti-government. And if that 
um, you know, pushback from the government continues to be strong. I mean, where are we going to be in 10 years? Um, yeah, I know. Um, I think it's extremely important that people realize that, that all of us are one step away um, from being victims of the system. You know, I, I think it's extremely important to, to realize that it's not just them, you know, it's not just the, the other who's in, is in prison. It's, it's, it's you and me, it's our friends, it's our family, it's our, our sons and daughters and Oh yeah, all those families that were in there, all those children were going to grow up fatherless. And I can't imagine that there's a really good justification for that. At least not with the majority of the people there. I mean, I don't know. I'm just happy that they're that they're being nice to Ross, but Ross is really really lucky compared to a lot of the other people. Ross has people out on the outside yeah. that are doing entire shows about him. I mean, think about how much time you and I alone have spent on Liberty I mean, like Ross and 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 so many different people have contributed. But imagine being one of those forgotten people that no one even cares about, and you feel like there's no sense of purpose for your suffering. I mean, I guess maybe that is what, part of the reason why Ross is is able to be strong is because he feels like he has a sense of purpose. Well, and it's particularly. I mean, I hate to I hate to even mention this too, but um, as far as we know. Um, What, where where is the, the 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 hope for Ross at this point? I mean, uh, is there an appeal in the process? Oh yeah, no, there is an appeal, and I think that if you look at it from the many many things that happened in the trial, I mean, there were at least five major league things that happened in the trial that were completely not okay. But I don't know if the government cares. They didn't care then. They specifically didn't care. They wanted to make a statement, F you, don't even try this again. Right. So I don't know why that um, same approach would all of a sudden change, but I think that from a legal perspective, to me, it seems like they have a pretty good appeal, um, but you never really know, I guess. Well, that's, that's, it was interesting. They're very hard to win. Appeals are very hard to win, and also it's so expensive for the legal fees. I mean, they're close to $30,000 a month. So hopefully if people saw the movie today and they um, were moved by it, that they can donate to the um, to the family for the legal fees because they're just mounting and overwhelming. The worrisome, worrisome thing about the idea of appeal, of, uh, appeal is that, I mean, it seems like there's, you know, like I said, three very solid grounds for appeal. I mean, just a mistrial, right? But 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 just watching the movie, there were very solid grounds for him to never be convicted either, you know. Absolutely, that's that's what. But they didn't choose to see it that way. They didn't even let that be a, a, a consideration, and that really upsets me. And it doesn't make it seem that hopeful. But at the same time, you know, Ross actually wrote me something one day because you know we, we talk or whatever um, in letters, and he says. You know, I don't want you to be upset about, you know, what's happened with you or what's happened with me or with anything really, because as long as we're alive, there's reason to hope. Hmm. And I was really, really struck by that statement. And I remain, uh, it remains in my mind oftentimes when I feel dejected. I mean, the life of a liberty freedom fighter isn't always easy um, to remain optimistic. But I think that if he can do that, then that's a really big gift that he can use to teach other people to be that way. Uh, Tatiana, thank you for, for doing that. I feel like, you know, when you visited him, you were visiting on behalf of really um, tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of millions of people. Um, and you, you kind of became an ambassador for all of us to him. And so thank you for sharing the story. Can well, you, uh, I mean, I think that that's, that's definitely something that had a really deep impact on me. And, um, you know, when I was leaving, all the families are saying goodbye to them, their, their, you know, themselves or whatever, their children. And then there's, you see the pretty, this pretty Spanish girl and her beefcake boyfriend, and they kiss each other. And it's like the last people on earth. And then they march them behind this glass wall. And it wasn't even about 
everybody in this moment. It was about people throughout history and that glass wall, however it's being enforced. Maybe it's a steel wall or whatever, but it really drove home the the reality of, of what does that mean to put someone into a cage? And it wasn't, it wasn't a good thing to remember. And now I really have been thinking a lot about doing a gig, you know, at a prison, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to do it. I really need to spend some time looking into it. And I feel like because of my political beliefs, they wouldn't allow me to do it. And that in itself is crazy because Johnny Cash was able to do it. So, why can't Tatiana, you know, who cares about me? Johnny Cash was more famous than me when he did it. So, you know, I should be able to, but I think that there's, I don't know. I don't think that they're looking to make that situation um, better for the prisoners. And I think that that's really, really sad. Well, I've been, I've been trying to, uh, uh, through prisons for, for years. And really? Yeah. To do what? Um, I'm just interested in them, you know? Um, just because I don't know, I just feel like they're forgotten, and I, I, I I'm, I'm interested in them, and I want to know more, more about it. And you know, the, the couple times I've, I've had these kind of jail experiences, I, it's just, it's just made me feel a real connection to prison life and the people there. And I would like to, to do something, um, but it's, I've, I've never had any success getting anywhere near. So. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to either, but I'm going to keep trying. I just need a little bit more bandwidth to to do it because I think it's I think it's a statement that needs to be made. I mean, this is way worse than when Johnny Cash was doing it. Um it's horrendous. It's disgusting. And it's still shocking to me how people don't really value the importance of that, but I think if you humanize it and you take it away from this is the bad guy in the mask with the eyes cut out and he's got a baseball bat and he's going to kill you and turn it into humans. Um, I think that that's really where hopefully we can drive some change forward. Uh, Tatiana, I've loved having our discussion tonight. Thank you so much for, for joining me and talking about this, uh, this topic. Absolutely. It was really good. And I liked the movie night. I think it was really cool to, to be able to watch it with everybody. And it was really nice of Alex and the team to uh, to let us all watch it together. And of course, um, I don't know, I just, before we finish, I wanna remind everybody to please tell people about the movie, share it, don't just do it once or twice. And um, you know, if you have money to donate, please donate and get the word out because I think that we've got a really good tool of explaining the philosophy with this movie to a certain extent. Thank you, Tatiana. I agree. And we'll be in touch soon, okay? Thank you, Jeffrey. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye, -bye.